as Tom's already mentioned, I'm not from around here originally. Uh, and my transition from the UK to the US is one of the things that has motivated me to do the work I am doing on the American dream and on upward mobility or the lack of it. I'm also very grateful that Tom mentioned this Politico Top 50 award. I have to say that in previous years, I've thought that that list of most influential thinkers was ridiculous, <laughs> completely subjective, didn't seem to bear any relation to reality at all. But I must say, this year <laughs> really nailed it. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to tell you, uh, Tom finished with an incredibly moving story about his own, his own life, his own family, uh, and then his own teacher. So uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of my own story, too, because it's woven through my work, and it's woven through the book that Tom was good enough to refer to. And this sense that actually the American dream is alive, but that it's being hoarded, that it's being enjoyed by those who start their lives at the top of society and are able to maintain their position there and the position of their children there, and that colleges in America are simultaneously our best hope, the great equalizer, to use man's phrase, but also, as things currently stand, one of our biggest challenges, because the way that the US college system works today makes it as much a great stratifier as a great equalizer. And the challenge is to change that equation. College education remains the unrealized possibility, to use Tom's phrase. So um, I'm going to start with my own story for me as a child, growing up in the UK. And yes, there it is. I grew up in a working class town north of London in a society that is saturated with class consciousness. In the UK, almost everything's about class, what you wear, what sports you play, what silverware you use. There's this constant exhausting sense of which class are you in, constant calibration. And I grew up hating it, and it motivated much of my work in the UK on social mobility. I hated the fact that one of the phrases that's used in England is that people ought to know their place. Think about that, know your place. By contrast, the US, a country where people don't know their place, where people take their place, where people, to use that quintessential American phrase, make something of themselves. Not somebody else makes it of them. Not using other resources, but make something of themselves. And so I grew up as a, as a child in this class-saturated society, my mother was so terrified that our background would prevent us from rising. My father was first-generation college student, both parents from working-class backgrounds. We were at a working-class public high school, and she was worried about, A, the way we spoke, so she threatened us with elocution lessons, or as we dubbed them, electrocution. <laughs> if we dropped our T's, said butter or bitter or computer, she used to get horrified because she thought we had to speak like this in order to get ahead. She may not have been wrong about that. But she also, most disastrously and painfully, forced us to take ballroom dancing lessons. <laughs> Every Saturday morning for a miserable year of my adolescence, I was forced to some upstairs room to learn how to waltz, how to cha-cha, how to foxtrot. I kid you not. And why? Was I made to endure this? Why were my partners, my dancing partners, made to endure this? Because my mother was terrified that there'd be some corporate engagement in our future where we'd be expected to know how to waltz. The boss would say, oh, would you like to take my wife around the, for a spin around the dance floor? And we would be unable to do so, and that would kill our career. <laughs> my mother watched a lot of television. She denied this, by the way. I went home recently, and, I, and I, this story had been in the UK press about her doing it. She denied it. She said, that's not true. I didn't make you do that. So I had to go and find the box with all the certificates. <laughs> Waltz, level one. Cha-cha, level one. Rum I never got past level one. I'm like, <laughs> my ballroom dancing GPA was like 1.2 at best. <laughs> uh, and so uh, one of the reasons why I think I ended up married to an American and moving to America, and I've lived here, I'd lived here before, um, is because of this sense of a society that isn't so constrained, so stuck, so, so class-bound. And so, last year, I became a US citizen. 
So I'm now the proud possessor of a US citizen. And here is me uh, with my naturalization certificate. Uh, and I have to say, the ceremony is quite something. Hands up who's been to a citizenship ceremony. Yeah, there, I mean, some of you will perhaps have been uh, taking the oath yourself, but even if you're not, just to be with the people that are taking it. Uh, 47 countries represented, 53 people from all around the world, and it was quite a big deal for me, it meant a lot to me, but I tell you what, it meant a lot more to the woman standing by me from Afghanistan with her child in her arms. And so if you want to see the kind of sense of what, what it's like to be American, and then as it happens, it was the very last day in my state of Maryland. Where's Maryland? Maryland here? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> a couple of people from Maryland, yes. <laughs> it was the very last day I had to become a citizen in Maryland in order to register to vote in the presidential election. That was true for all of us, and it was the last ceremony of the day. And so I literally was in the last group of people who became eligible to vote. Uh, and we all trooped straight to the Women's League of Voters, signed up to vote. And so actually last year, because I still have my UK citizenship, I was able to vote both in the US presidential election and in the UK referendum on membership of the European Union. So it was a banner year for me, <laughs> politically. Not getting, don't want to get partisan. But nonetheless, one of the reasons I came is also I wanted, uh, my wife and I wanted our children to at least experience some of their uh, time uh, in the US and for our youngest two to finish their high school. This is many years ago, by the way. <laughs> They're much older now. Um, uh, to at least experience some of the US education system and a kind of sense of possibility and pluralism and openness that US society gives you. And so that's one of the reasons why I made the own, my own personal journey here. And I've made what I think is a difficult discovery, at least for me which is that the American class system operates as ruthlessly and as efficiently as the UK one I left behind. But it does so under a veneer of classlessness. It does so camouflaged by the myth of meritocracy, camouflaged by this idea that only here. And I agree with Tom that there is a very, very powerful sense of the American dream which drives people, but at the same time, we shouldn't kid ourselves that anybody other than those who are born fortunate are able to live it. So that's been difficult for me uh, in my work to discover that. I think there's two reasons why we don't talk as much about class in the US, and the good reason is because of the remain, remaining salience of race and racism and structural racism uh, in the US. The bad reason is the one I've alluded to, which is a sense that we're a classless society. In the US, people have their kids wearing t-shirts that say future president. That's a great thing. You don't get future king in the UK <laughs> or future queen, right? We know who it's going to be, <laughs> uh, barring some accident. Uh, and of course, you know, the monarchy's fun for you. You're probably all very interested in Meghan Markle and all, and that is a big deal, actually. Um, the, the British, everyone's thinking, because you know, there's a, a potential race element to that. I don't think there's really an element to that. The thing is that the, the U, people in the UK are a bit suspicious of American women marrying our princes. And people who know their history will know what I'm talking about. Um, so we do know who it's going to be. But it's fun for you because, you know what, the, for you the monarchy's all kind of Downton Abbey and it's kind of fine, it's over there. You're not a subject of Her Majesty the Queen. It's not as fun then. I am now both a subject of Her Majesty the Queen and a citizen of the United States of America. I tell you, it feels different. The idea of a hereditary system with status passed on from one generation to the next is the very thing that America is supposed to stand against. And yet many of the institutions of American society, including its college education system, perpetuate the inheritance of poverty and the inheritance of affluence. There is a very big problem, and I think I remain of the view that college is part of the solution. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about somebody else now. Um, if this works, yes. Yeah. So there are a few people in the audience who are a little bit younger, so just in case, this is Barack Obama, <laughs> 44th President of the United States. <laughs> and doesn't it feel like a long time ago? Yeah. Really does, right? <laughs> it's not that long. <sighs> it's been a long year. Um, but uh, Barack Obama suffered a U-turn in January of 2015 
which for me illuminated some of the issues we have around education in this country. So I'm going to tell the story of that. What happened in January 2015 is that Barack Obama became the first president in living memory to ask his own party to vote against his own proposal in his tax, in his budget, before it even got to Congress. And the story of how that happened was the moment that I decided to write my book about dream hoarding, and when I saw illuminated, perhaps most vividly, the workings of the US class system, and in particular, the way that the upper middle class, those of us who are in the top 20% of the distribution, college educated, kids gonna go on to be college educated, are in fact hoarding the American dream, and are doing so with now what I consider to be a sense of entitlement. You know, it was a culture of entitlement. I think there's a bit of a culture of entitlement at the top of American society now because of this meritocratic thing. So what happened? So I'm going to do this as, you know, how do they say in Hollywood, based on true events. So the president's flying on Air Force One. He is flying from uh, India to Saudi Arabia. This is in January. His budget was, uh, came out about a couple of weeks before. And with him is Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi gets a phone call. Nancy Pelosi gets a phone call from this man, Chris Van Hollen. At the time, my congressman, now the junior senator for Maryland. <laughs> Chris doesn't come out very well of this story, by the way, although I'm a big fan of his. But anyway, uh, so this is Chris, and he says, look, Nancy, this idea in the budget has to go. My inbox is filling up. It's a terrible idea. You have to persuade the president to drop this proposal. Pelosi and Van Hollen, pretty liberal, I would say. And so what was this horrific idea that the president was planning to do? What, what could have been this kind of horribly regressive idea? Well, we'll find out in just a moment. So she says, I'm on Air Force One. I'll just pop down the corridor uh, and see the president. So she goes to the president. He's in his office, and she knocks on the door. As I say, I don't really know what happened, but uh, come on in. Who is it? Oh, it's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> what do you want? I want you to drop this crazy tax proposal. This idea has got to go. I just spoke to Chris. Terrible idea. Get rid of it. I'll consult with my senior advisors. <laughs> Get back to you. Goes back to the office. Calls the White House. Hello, White House, it's the president. I don't know how these things work here. <laughs> Can you kill this idea? Sure enough, the very next day. The plan is dropped. Who knows what a 529 college savings plan is? Right. Many of you all know. 529s don't come out of this very well either, by the way. Um, I don't know if that's why you're cheering, but let's find out. Um, 529 uh, college savings plans, they're free of capital gains tax in Maryland. I can set, uh, with two kids and a wife, I can set $10,000 of savings a year against my Maryland income tax. Uh, there's no gift tax, so you can super fund it. Uh, uh, it's a Bush era tax cut. Clinton vetoed it, Bush passed it. It's now in the tax code. And Obama's plan was to, going forward, to remove this tax break. Who benefits from this tax break? Well, let's think about this for a minute. You need to be thinking far enough ahead and have the discretionary income to save for your kid's college. This shows you, the next one shows you, by, quint, by quartiles, poorest quarter of the population on the left, richest quarter of the population on the right, what percentage of people in that category have a 529, and what's the average balance in that 529? In the bottom quartile, by the way, in the survey, there's one person which we've turned into a percentage with no money in their 529. It doesn't make much sense because the capital gains tax break is valuable to the people at the top. If you go higher up the income distribution, it gets more. So Obama looked at this and said, this is crazy. No evidence actually increases savings. Why don't we use that money to try and expand access instead? Why don't we use that money for, for like a refundable credit type system? Why don't we find a way to help the kids from the bottom of that chart? get to and through college, rather than lining the pockets of the American upper middle class. Why don't we do that instead? And all hell broke loose, not just from Republicans, but from liberal Democrats too. And so he had to reverse course, saying it was a distraction. And in that moment, I saw how entitled my fellow members of the American upper middle class had become. They thought they deserved that, they thought they'd worked for it, and they were terrified about the cost of college to their kids. So a, a, a straightforward, easy proposal was killed by the American upper middle class. And I thought, well, these people really know how to look after themselves. And that structural problem is one of the things that led me to think about this. By the way, for those who are following the Republican tax reforms, the House plan uh, expands 529 plans in two ways. One, it would allow you not only to use it for post-secondary education, but also for K-12 education. So there, if it passes, there'll be a tax-preferred way to save for private K-12 education. 
as well as for post-secondary. The other reform, and this would be a genuine, genuine precedent breaker in US tax history, is to allow people to start saving into the 529 plan of their unborn child. So if it passes as stands, it will be the first time that a unborn child, a fetus, has status in the US tax code. And you can think about the politics of both of those moves as we go forward. So I decided to write about this um, in my book, Dream Hoarders. And to, for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on education. In my book, I talk about housing and lots of other things too. But as I've said, education is the great equalizer. People are quite fond of saying there's no silver bullet for upward mobility. You know, you've heard that phrase now. I've now heard the phrase, there's no silver bullet, so often that I'm going to start saying, there is a silver bullet. And it is completing college. There is nothing quite like completing college to change the trajectory of someone given their background. I'm going to share that's the good news, is the closest thing we've got to a silver bullet. If you get to an institution and you complete, then you do pretty much as well as the other people who get to that institution and complete, regardless of your economic background. Nothing else does quite the same job of detaching you from your economic background as completing college. Nothing else. The bad news we'll get to in a moment, which is so few people get to do that. But first of all, let's start with the good news, right? This is, uh, so I have charts. I know Tom didn't have charts. I know there's discussion about whether people like charts. Let me be clear. I don't speak to my wife and kids without charts. You know, how was your day? Let's bring up a PowerPoint deck. <laughs> See how Use a regression line. This is, I'm only for the next few slides, I'm just going to talk about people who are born into the bottom 20% of the distribution. That's poor. That's basically where the federal poverty line is. Okay? All of these numbers are just people who are born poor. And then where do they end up? So do they end up in the bottom, which is on the left-hand side? Do they stay poor? Or do they make it Horatio Alger style up to the top? What percentage? end up in, on which rung of the ladder. You can think of this as five rungs of the ladder. So if you don't finish high school and you're born poor, you are, to use a technical term, screwed. You're basically staying poor, maybe I'm moving a little bit, but actually you're in real trouble. If you finish, now this is backward looking, of course, because I, I need almost a generation to find out where people end up. So this would not hold today, but it's just going to show you the power of education. Let's say you finish high school, which is the red. Yeah, you're doing a lot better. You're much less likely to be stuck in poverty. This is all racist. But what about finishing college, getting a four-year college degree? So the way that your educational, you know all this, but I'm just putting data to it, the way that your educational attainment totally alters your chances of upward, upward mobility. It's clear from the data. It's also true for, for two-year colleges. Obviously, the numbers are slightly different. Um, and if you break it by race, the story changes a little bit again. There's more benefit to white kids getting a college education than to kids of color. Here's the problem, though. And this is data from Raj Chetty. Raj Chetty is now the leader in this field because he has all the IRS data. And so he has the IRS data of parents and kids, and he knows which colleges people went to, too. So if you're interested in your own college, the New York Times has an interactive based on Raj's work where you can put in every institution and see the income background of where your students are coming from and where they end up. That's why he's able then to see, create a mobility scorecard, how many poor kids are you bringing in and how good are you at propelling them up. Cooney, by the way, where's Cooney? Yes, Cooney, right. Cooney is one of the best performers in the data uh, in terms of upward mobility. I was at Cooney last week and uh, they do incredibly well at bringing in low-income kids and not only bringing them in but helping them complete and then they move up the distributional ladder. Historically black colleges, I know that they've, you've already been praised, but historically black colleges do very, very well because they bring in so many low-income kids. Uh, and then they're able to do a pretty good job of moving them up as well, but they're really on access, they're doing very well. So anyway, but this, however, is a chart which shows you, the, the bottom axis is where, do you, where are your parents on the income distribution, from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right? And the vertical axis is showing, are you in college between the ages of 18 and 21? So this is, does not include mature students as a particular sample, but nonetheless, that kind of sense of do you leave high school and go into college? That's sort of who's on that trajectory. And this is the relationship between the income of your parents and your chances of being in college. You know how sometimes, I don't know if you've ever seen kind of social scientists, they put up these scatter plots, with lots of dots on it, and then they put a line through it to show how they're correlated, right? A line of best fit and correlation. You look at it and you go, really? I'm not sure. This one doesn't need the line of best fit. It's on there. And I would suggest to you that this chart alone 
tells us a very great deal about the challenge that faces us. It is very rare in social science to find that kind of relationship. It's so strong. To be able to predict with that much accuracy whether you're going to be in college, all I need to know is how much money have your parents got? Where are your parents on the household income distribution? That's in college, that's just attendance. But then let's think about which kinds of college. Oh, sorry, I meant to say this first. Um, this is just showing you the income distribution of SAT scores. And I think it's important in a college context to have this because this is a two decade challenge. It's not as if you know, colleges, by and large, are setting out to be stratifiers. Very often they're working quite hard. But what comes before is incredibly important too. And you see these massive income gaps in the SAT scores. So that means you've got to rethink admissions policy, rethink your reliance on standardized tests, move to much more aggressively uh, kind of uh, class-based affirmative action, et cetera. But it also means that we need to, to, to work harder at this level too. However, one of the problems with this debate is there's a tendency to just blame someone else. There's this game of finger pointing. Do you play pass the parcel here? Is that a US game where you just pass the parcel around? And the music stops? No? Good, it's a really weird game. <laughs> anyway, the point is that what you see is that the colleges will say, well, what can we do? Look at these gaps. High schools just aren't doing a good enough job preparing them. We're spending a lot of time in remedial, so it's not really our fault. And then the high schools will say, honestly, the damage is done in middle school. By the time they get to us, the gaps are really there. The middle schools will say, honestly, you see them coming in an elementary school, they're not ready. They blame the kindergarten teachers. And the kindergarten teachers say, have you seen how these kids arrive? I blame the parents. And so it goes. And so what you get is a situation where there's a lot of, a lot of people quite justifiably pointing at each other, not the people in this room. The fact is that the education gaps that we see at every level are to some extent nobody's fault but everybody's responsibility. And the truth is that everybody has to do better. It is no good just pointing to these sorts of charts and saying, what are we supposed to do? It's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. So let's stop talking about blame and instead talking about responsibility. Hence the book, please buy the book. Oh, it's an audio book now. I had to audition for the part of reading it. That was humiliating. <laughs> I passed though. This is the argument of my book, and I'm not going to spend very much time on it here. I'm going to fo focus more on education. But my basic argument is, you can see it, that the upper middle class, as I define them, top 20% are separating. That inequality goes across generations. That a lot of that is about education, as I think I've already shown. There's also some opportunity hoarding going on. And that finally, we need a culture change. And we need to think about our own responsibility. So in the interest of time, I'm going to just go through this argument relatively quickly, as I say, audiobook. If you get audible, it's free. So there's this whole story about we are the 99%. This does show you the top 1% of the income distribution pulling away. This is income since 79, and then 19% below them, and then the 40% below them, and the 40% below them. But social scientists do all their dirty work in their left-hand axis. It goes to 2 million. Let's take out the top 1%, change the, the, the left-hand axis. There has been no increase in income inequality in the bottom 80% of the US distribution. The bottom 40 and the middle 40 are basically in the same place in relation to each other as they were. It is the top 25, 10% who are pulling away. They're pulling away in terms of income, but they're also pulling away in terms of education, in terms of marriage rates, in terms of economic segregation of, their, of our neighborhoods, occupations, etc. And so this is a class, I'm only showing you income here, but it's a class-based separation of the upper middle class, the top 20%. The people who expect their kids to get a good four-year college degree, expect to be able to own their house, expect to be able to save for retirement, live the American dream, and everybody else who is stuck beneath them. Uh, it endures across generations. I'm not going to say any more about that. I think I've said enough about this. But I do want to talk a bit about this idea of meritocracy, because education plays a very important part in the meritocracy story. And to alert you to the fact that in 1958, when the, the term was coined by Michael Young, this was the book he wrote. Thoroughly recommend it. Uh, although it's very old, uh, it's a dystopia. It's a description of what would happen to a society that came to believe itself to be a meritocracy, when in fact it was not. Uh, what happens? Income inequality rises because the winners in a meritocracy feel entitled to their winnings. After all, the reason I'm doing so well can only be a result of my own brilliance and my own hard work. We, that we have this problem in the US, this is a US phrase, of being born on third base but thinking we hit a triple. 
Uh, so inequality goes. Secondly is that there's a corrosion, loss of self-respect among those who don't succeed. Because in a meritocracy, it's really hard to be poor or unsuccessful. You've got no one else to blame. You're constantly being told, if you just work hard and do the right thing, then you'll succeed. If you're not successful, then what does that mean about you? And so you, you lose compassion. The economic gap becomes an empathy gap. Finally, people increasingly start to marry each other based on the educational credentials of the spouse in order to breed super bright kids of the future. And so you see what uh, sociologists call in the most unromantic phrase in sociology, assortative mating. It means marrying someone like you, college degree, etc. cetera. Um, I don't suggest you use that in a dating profile. <laughs> Seeking to assortatively mate with someone with a good quality for your college degree. But it's a warning. Um, this is the data just on which kinds of colleges people go to, and I won't linger too much on this because you all know this. This is people who are actually at college. Um, so where do they go? And just to highlight the fact that two-year institutions who are the unpolished jewel in the crown of the US opportunity structure cater to most of the kids that we are most worried about right now. The, uh, and so we, you don't hear people talk about that. We, people talk a lot about loans and four years and all of that, but the resources that are available to two-year colleges, there's an extraordinary inequity there, um, which we could talk more about. Meanwhile, the top 20, their kids go to Ivies and Selectives. That's basically, that's the norm. That's what you do now. If you're from the top 20%, you, 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 you assume that. It means, by the way, now I'm looking at it the other way around. If you look at it from the point of view of the institution, where are their kids from? Non-selectives, selectives, and Ivies and elites. Well, Basically, all of their students on the right are from the top 20%. You see much more, you see more of a mix in the middle, and then the non-selectors are the ones catering to the bottom. So if you want to see the American class system, look at the American college system. That is where it's most brightly illuminated. The, the way that people are, uh, end up in certain institutions, the different outcomes they have, will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, so Sunni's on here, but not Cooney, sorry. But uh, Cooney's number story, this just makes the same point, which income quintile are students from? And they just see the top 1%. There's a bit of opportunity hoarding going on. Um, if in the interest of this audience, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I will say that housing is part of the story. An exclusionary zoning with racist origins, but now classist intent, means that houses are expensive, people can't afford them, and then we zone people out of the most affordable neighborhoods. This is the rise in land use regulation over time. American land is suddenly quite scarce and quite expensive. And if you organize your education system geographically and you have a mortgage interest deduction which allows you to protect the value of your house, so housing and residential segregation underlies a lot of this hoarding that I talk about. Legacy preferences, are you kidding me? You're going to have a hereditary principle in your college admissions process? Seriously? Seriously? Hands up, no. Um, <laughs> we got rid of it in the middle of the 20th century in the UK, right? Our royal family, who I was just poking at, they don't get to go to Oxford and Cambridge because their grades aren't good enough. They go to St. Andrews, and then all the Americans send their kids to St. Andrews, which is now one of the richest colleges in the UK as a result. Um, but uh, it may be a symbolic thing, but seriously. I mean, it's only invented to keep the Jewish students out in the middle of the 20th century. That's not something to be proud of, surely. Um, oh, these are the admissions rates for people who are legacies into these elite colleges. Hmm, seem high to me. Maybe they would have got in anyway. I don't know, they won't share the data. And then lastly, internships, which are becoming a really important transition from college into the labor market. And again, selective colleges are able to put people through those internships. This is a survey of employers saying how important internships are to them now. But internships in the US are very often handed out on a grace and favor basis based on who you know, what, what you know. Half of them are unpaid. And boy, is that a good way of stitching up the opportunity structure. And yet Americans do it without a backward glance. Bill de Blasio, internships for his son and daughter. Really? Uh, that would have ended his political career in the UK. Here, didn't, it passed without a murmur. People don't think they're doing anything wrong when they stitch up an internship for a friend or for their own kids. They are doing something wrong. And so finally, what does all this mean? There are lots of policies which we can talk about. Many of you will know many more about them than, than I. But first of all, we have to get past this problem, this idea that yes, the rich should pay more, yes, that people should give something up, but I am not going to be one of those people. And I've come to believe that if we're interested in inequality, we have to look in the mirror. 
We have to stand in our own shoes. We have to think about our own institutions, our own communities, and think about what we are doing day to day. In a wonderful book called If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich, Jerry Cohen said, social justice is found in the thick of everyday life. In the thick of everyday life. Not just in policies and distant institutions, but in the thick of our own life. And Richard Hofstadter, when he was talking about the progressive era, said that it wasn't it wasn't a movement that was directed just against others. It was partly directed inward. It was an affair of the conscience. And I actually think that to get the policies we need, we need a change in culture, a uh, political culture, and that that will only happen if we start to see ourselves as both part of the problem and therefore part of the solution. And our own institutions and our own decisions in the thick of everyday life, what we do tomorrow is hugely important. I'm going to finish one of my favorite quotes is from Robert Kennedy. Because people will say, look, I can do this, but will that change anything? Just me doing this? Will that change anything in my institution if everyone else is still carrying on? Well, Robert Kennedy said the following. Every time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current, a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Each of you can make a change, and it may feel like a ripple. But if we all do it, it creates a current that can knock down these walls. So my ask of you as a scholar and as a father, as a new American, is let's make some waves. Thank you.